Good evening. Welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> Let's, uh, as, as we just sang, basically it was the Lord's Prayer, right? We do that most or almost every Sunday here. As uh, let your kingdom come, let your glory fall. Oh, so we're bringing the glory to the throne tonight. So I hope... You here, and if you're watching at home, can, can um, do that with us tonight. So let's all stand, if you're able, as uh, we gather for worship tonight and, and sing about how the Lord's blessed us, and, uh, and we're just going to praise Him tonight. So uh, sing along with us. Bless the Lord. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. 
Thank you, team, for leading us off in worship this evening. It won't take me long up here, so don't get too comfortable, because Jesse only gave me three verses to read. Well, welcome to Waterway Church this evening. Glad you could join us. Um, for devotions, I'm going to read from Matthew 18, uh, verses 15 to 17. Now... In the beginning of the chapter, um, I kind of like because the disciples ask him, ask Jesus a question. They ask him, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> I honestly have to laugh at that question because, you know what? I'd probably be asking the same thing. You know, like, hey, who's, who's great around here? Like, you know, we're all something. Now, who's the greatest? And... Uh, you know, Jesus is as calm as can be. Just, you know, a little kid come over here and sit on my lap and says, unless you're like one of these, yeah, you're nothing. Uh, I, just, I just feel like that puts a picture to this whole uh, chapter. But the verses I'm going to read, uh, 15 to 17, says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen to you, take if but if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Simple, but hard stuff. But I feel like, as a church, if, if our mission is to become more like Jesus, well, this is what we do. We, we love each other. We don't ask about who's the greatest. We're just like, hey, you know, bring each other together. And that's becoming more like Jesus. And that's what his whole desire um, for us is. It's like John Piper's, mention him again, um, theme is, you know, becoming more like, or it's desiring God, becoming more like God, desiring God. And that's what this passage to me is talking about. Um, move on to prayer requests. I want to remember to pray for Barry Hostetter and the whole family uh, it's not a not been so good report for Barry. Um, also pray for Dennis Brackbrill as he's still wrestling with uh, some shingles. We do have a praise of uh, Judy Federoff is feeling much better, so there's an answer prayer um, there already. And we also want to continue to pray for Lana Johnson. Uh, she's in Texas helping to settle her mother's estate this week, so pray for her strength and wisdom as she de deals with challenging situation. Um, also want to remind you there's an offering box in the back. Um, we've been blessed here as a church and we continue to be blessed and we thank you for that. Um, it's good to be able to return back to God uh, what he's blessed us with. And also uh, I want to remind you that October is coming up and October is Pastor Appreciation Month. We have two great pastors in our congregation, praise the Lord. So whatever you're able, send a note, send a card. Uh, I know Steve likes chocolate. Uh, maybe I'll throw a bag of potatoes in your, in your mailbox. Uh, that's not going to work. Um, yeah, whatever you can do, send a note to our pastors. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. 
Father God, it is a, a privilege to come into your house and worship you this evening, to bless your holy name, to lift you up and magnify you. Lord, as we desire to become more like you, give us wisdom, give us courage, give us strength, Lord. And Lord, there are people around us who are suffering. Lord, carry them like Barry Hostetter and his family. Dennis Brackbill, as he works hard and yet suffers with some pain. Lord, we give you praise for answer prayer for Judy. We continue to pray for Lana and her work that she needs to do. God, we thank you for our worship team. We thank you for Jesse and Steve. May we all sing and honor and glorify you. Jesus name. Amen. Stand with us once again if you're able and uh, continue on in our worship time and song and lift up the name of Jesus. Name strong and mighty tower. Shell, he's a shelter like no other.
King of Kings. You may be seated. We'll edit that part out of the video tonight. <laughs> Any of you grow up watching Mr. Rogers like I did? I know a few of you, a few of you are, are, uh, are maybe trying to forget it, but do you remember when he'd bring a box onto the, and he'd say, guess what's in my box? And he'd shake it around. It was usually brought by Mr. McFeely, who always brought a speedy delivery, right? Well, this one's brought by Amazon. I think they're speedier yet. Um, I had some fun deliveries this week, and I think you were listening to me last week when I preached my sermon. That's always exciting, because sometimes us preachers wonder, does anybody hear what we're saying? Last week on Sunday morning, one of you brought us three brand new Razor scooters. Last week on Sunday afternoon, there was a family who was here, and uh, after church, apparently they ran out somewhere and bought another one. They brought it back and gave it to Rachel Bender while she was cleaning. They said, here, this is for the kids. And uh, we had a couple more dropped off this week, and then today, I got here, there was a package at the front door, and a package at the back door. Um, everything that we received today is in here. And, and I just wanted to show you um, what we got. We got, a, got another Razor scooter. So I think right now we have, we have seven brand new ones for our 11 kids. That's pretty fun. I really wanted to ride this in here today, but um, this is not meant to hold this. And so I'll just show you what arrived at my doorstep, or here at our doorstep at Waterway. Um, we got some other scooters. Do any of you from that same Mr. Rogers there, do you remember these? Some, some of you remember these, right? If you're at school and you're scooting, it was these guys. And, um, and then we got, uh, we got a, a jump rope for, for somebody who likes pink and a jump rope for somebody who likes blue. 
and we got some sidewalk chalk and some more sidewalk chalk. And, and here, are, here are what the notes in our packages said. For the kids from a friend. For the kids from a friend. For the school kids from a friend. And for the school kids from a friend. How awesome. How awesome to be part of a church that says, huh, there's a need and there's something I can do and I'm going to do it. That was the challenge last week, right? At the end of the sermon, those of you who listened, you realize that um, what I challenged you to do was on um, either on Saturday night or Sunday, whenever you were here, think about what you might be able to do to serve God's kingdom. The next day, pray about it and ask God if you heard right. And then the third day, do something about it. Well, a couple people did. That's pretty nice. Uh, they did it in a way that was just very obvious to me, even though I don't know who they are. Did you guys think about that? Did you think about that as your week went on, about how you're serving people, how you're looking out for people? I hope you did. And if you didn't, if you forgot to, or if you weren't here last week, well, do it this weekend, right? You can double up on assignments, right? Think about how you can serve the Lord and the community around us. Pray about it. Once you've got an idea, ask God, is this really a good idea? Is this really you? And then follow through. Follow through. Today, um, I'd like to look with you at, at Matthew chapter 17. This is a passage that popped up to me um, a little earlier this week, and, and it just kind of uh, elbowed its way into being the sermon. And we're going to look at uh, a chunk of Scripture here. We're going to start in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 17. We're going to go to the end of the chapter, and there are kind of three little pieces here, and we're going to see how they relate, because I think they do. And so there is this account in Matthew 17, verse 14. It's talking about Jesus and his disciples. It says, when they came to the crowd, and there was often a crowd. This is near the end of Jesus' ministry. He's been ministering for a couple of years. People know him. They don't all like him, but everybody knows who he is. There's crowds when Jesus is around. And so when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. When they came together in Galilee, that is Jesus and his disciples, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. And now hear the third little account of Jesus and his travels, starting in verse 24. It says, after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Here again, three accounts of Jesus traveling. Jesus speaks with, his, with a crowd. He speaks with his disciples. At first, in verse 14, if you just kind of go back up your page in Matthew 17, here's a man who approaches Jesus. He says, Lord, have mercy on my son. He, he knows who Jesus is. He calls him Lord. This man seems to have faith. We know that this, actually, we know that he does have faith because he is being persistent in his request. Here's a son who has had seizures and is suffering greatly. One of the other gospels said that he has had this problem since birth. Some of you know what it's like to deal with a child who is ill. What would you do for that child? You would do anything, wouldn't you? And here is this man. He says, I brought my boy to your disciples. They couldn't help him. When the disciples couldn't help, what did he do? Did he just walk away and say, well, I tried? No, he said, Jesus, I'm coming to you. 
He knew where the real power was. You'll remember, by this time, the disciples had been sent out before. Jesus had given them authority to heal. They had gone out. They had healed before. They had cast out demons before. These were things that the disciples had done. But for some reason, at this time, they couldn't do it. And Jesus' response when he sees all this, he says, Oh, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Now, he's not speaking just to this man, because this man obviously has some faith. He's not speaking just to the boy. He's not speaking just to his disciples. There's a whole crowd there. He's speaking to everybody. Oh, but how long do I have to put up with you? Have you ever said that when you were in the charge of some people who just didn't want to get in line? Maybe you were teaching a group of people. Maybe you were teaching a group of children. Oh, how long am I going to have to, why won't you get it? I've showed you a thousand times. Jesus, Jesus says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, unbelieving, he says, you generation, all of you out here, you don't get it, do you? And perverse, not perverse, this is not a sexual thing here like the word is often used today. Perverse, as you go back into languages, it's twisted, it's turned, it's not the way it ought to be, it's warped. He says, you unbelieving and warped generation, how long shall I stay with you? And then Jesus, the Son of God, how long shall I put up with you? And then he says, bring the boy here to me. He rebuked the demon, came out of the boy, and he was healed. The disciples came back. Why couldn't we drive it out? He said, because your faith is too small. Now, even a small amount of faith can accomplish great things, but Jesus said, this is a really hard thing. Your faith is too small. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. There is another translation of the Bible that says, this kind only come out by prayer and fasting. These disciples who had healed before weren't able to heal this time. It was difficult. It was a challenge. They failed. They gave up. Jesus says, don't, don't give up. You perverse generation, believe in me. A little later, he's reminding them the truth, verse 22, the second part of this account. It says, when the disciples then came together in Galilee, a little later, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day, he'll be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to have to die, but I'm going to come back to life. And they're filled with grief, a perverse generation. They, they, they're filled with grief because they're thinking of themselves. They're thinking how they're going to miss him. They're not thinking about what this can accomplish. Jesus says, I want you to think right about things, and I want you to have faith in me. And then in verse 24, a very interesting little nugget. It says, after Jesus and his disciples, they've been traveling. After they arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter. The two drachma te temple tax, this was a standard thing. In fact, a tax like this had been happening since the time of Moses. Way back when the law was first established, there was a, a tax that all the men 20 years old and over ought to give to help maintain the, the tabernacle or the temple that year. Kind of a normal thing that all Jewish men were sort of used to. Two drachmas, it's about two days' work. So in today's, well, we all work for different amounts of money, don't we? But a couple hundred dollars, several hundred dollars, there's this tax that happens every year, and, and it was typically due on Passover. And so there were Jewish people going out to collect this tax from Jewish men to pay for the temple and all of that. But it was known that at this time of Jesus, there was corruption, and there were some people who kind of skimmed off the top. It was not a, it was not a clean system. But this was a tax that the Jews were used to. And, and these people came up to Peter. They said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Peter says, yes, he does. In fact, at this time, Jesus would have been paying it for years. Jesus at this point is in his 30s. He's probably been paying it since he was in his early 20s. Yeah, Jesus pays the temple tax. But still, it's, it's one thing to know something. When someone else challenges you, don't you sometimes just get that little bit of, hmm, I better check this out. And Peter said, yeah, he pays the tax, but... It seems that he's troubled. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. Here we see the insight and the, the omniscience of Jesus. He says, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes from their own children or others? He says, Simon, the kings of the earth, they, they all collect taxes. What for? Now, Simon's been asked about the temple tax. Jesus is talking about taxes in general, right? Why do kings collect taxes? So that they can buy the things they want. 
In Jesus' time, back through history, when you had all these monarchies, all these kings and their families, oftentimes the taxes were collected not for the benefit of the people. <laughs> Even in our world right now, we complain about our taxes, but when we see the road get fixed, when we finally see the bridge get built, when we see things working the way they ought to, we say, well, maybe it's worthwhile. And this time, so often, the, the taxes that were paid were just to help the king live better. So Jesus says, the kings of the earth, Peter, when they collect their taxes, do they collect it from their own kids or from others? Well, Peter answered obviously. He said they collect it from others. Kings don't collect money from princes because they'd just be collecting money from themselves, right? Where do princes get their money? From the king. And so here, Jesus is asking Simon kind of a, a sideways question. He says, who do the kings tax? Their kids or, or everybody else? Peter says everybody else. Jesus says, well, then the children are exempt. You see what Jesus is saying here. He says, that's what happens out in the rest of the world. Now we've got a temple tax. Do you think God taxes his children? Jesus basically says, do you think I really owe this tax? All right? Isn't that what he's saying? Jesus says, the God of the temple is the one who's in charge of the temple, and I'm the son of God. Do you think that I really need to pay this tax? I, the father doesn't tax the son Taxes everybody else, but Peter says everybody else. Jesus says the children are exempt. And then verse 27. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. What was Peter's job? Do you remember? He was a fisherman, right? Did he know how to throw out a line? Jesus assumes that he has one. Maybe he had like a little, a little hook and line in his pocket all the time. I don't know, just one of those guys. Jesus says, well, just go out to the lake, throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. What was the temple tax for each man? It was two drachmas. Jesus says, you'll go find a coin worth four drachmas. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Now, I'm sure Jesus could have gone to the tax office. He could have gone to the tax collector, made an appointment, sat in line, waited for them to hear his case. He could have said, look, I'm the son of God. I don't really need to pay this tax. But wouldn't it be easier just to go fishing? And so he sends out Peter. Peter goes fishing, finds the coin, gives the tax. Here's Jesus basically saying, you know, we don't really need to pay this tax, but let's not offend them. God will take care of this. And they get a four drachma coin to pay the two drachma tax. Jesus was covered. Peter was covered. Do you see how free he is? Jesus, even in the midst of all the crazy, even in the midst of the perverse generation, even knowing that he's headed to the cross, that he's going to die and that he's going to rise and that his disciples don't get it. Do you see how all of this is, is pointing to a really amazing character, a really powerful Lord? It's pointing to a Jesus who has supreme faith in God above that God's plan is going to carry him through. Now, Gerald already mentioned it here today. Our mission at Waterway is to be more like Jesus, just the same as our mission was when we were known as Media Mennonite Church. Last week, I talked about service. Talked about how to have faith is an amazing thing, but faith ought to have hands and feet. It ought to have work attached to it. If you have faith, it, it drives you to do things. You understand this. This is a group of people that I know understands this. I'm just struck that when we look at how Jesus served in these three stories, as he deals with the crowd, as he deals with his disciples, and as he talks to Peter about the tax collectors, we see that Jesus had love and was willing to offer service to many people who were far from perfect. Jesus says, we can take care of that tax, even in a corrupt system, even to a corrupt governor, even to tax collectors who are skimming off the top. Just go fishing. It'll be all right. Jesus' service was often in the service of those who were deeply flawed and deeply in need. You know, at the Last Supper, he even served Judas, and he knew all about his betrayal, even ahead of time. And it strikes me that if we're to be more like Jesus in our service, our thinking has to be wide enough to serve the flawed and even those with whom we have deep disagreements. We have to serve outside of the body of Christ, for sure. We offer our service no matter what our snap assumptions may be. Somebody comes to us in need, what are we to do? Serve them, right? We offer our service and our love no matter what. 
the initial presentation might be. This is why racism is so despicable. Racism leads to a snap judgment about who someone is and how we should love or serve them just based on the color of their skin. Jesus' example says, don't do that. Jesus Jesus says, I'm serving even a perverse generation. If he can serve a perverse generation, we can serve everybody who comes to us. We don't have to make judgments right away, especially superficial, stupid judgments like people do when they're practicing racism. We have to serve outside the body of Christ, and this has led for immigration to be such a touchy issue, right? Are you hearing about these things in the news right now? Nobody's arguing about this stuff, are they? But immigration, some feel led to serve those in need with all the resources of our government and society, no matter where anyone was born. Others aren't sure that bringing folks all the way in is the best strategy, and so we argue about how do we serve? Where did they come from? What are they doing? Who were their parents? Where were they born? I would never be able to put together a workable immigration policy. I don't understand how that stuff works. But I know that when Jesus was met with people, he said, bring the boy to me. I'll take care of this. I got to pay a tax. There'll be a fish. We'll take care of this. Somebody needs to die on a cross. I can do that. We'll take care of this. You see his generosity and in situations even that that cost him. As we serve outside the body of Christ, we have to keep our pride in check. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, even people I've been related to, I didn't need help and I was poor, but I helped myself and I worked hard. They don't need my help either. Why can't they, whoever they are, why can't they help themselves? Haven't they brought this upon themselves? And church, aren't these some of the questions that we're tempted to ask when people come to us asking for help? Or when we simply see people in need of help, even if they haven't asked? These are hard questions, right? I mean, some of this is complex stuff. What do you do with immigration? How do you conquer racism? How do we make sure that we serve those who are most in need, regardless of how they got into that position? Outside the body of Christ, we are presented with all kinds of options for service. And I wonder if you and I are doing a really good job of serving all who are in need, being thoughtful about that and being generous with that. I just wonder about that because it's hard. And yet, how much need is in our world today? Even in our very wealthy society, there are people all around us. In the last 24 hours, I've seen people holding a little little sign and, and they say all kinds of different things about where they've been, but at the bottom it always says, please help. Anything that you can give. And then if they don't get any from this car, they go to the next car. You've seen this not very far away, right? How do we serve? We've got to be thinking and praying about this. We've got to be following the example of Jesus. But it's not just those outside the body of Christ who need our love and our service and our generosity. Even inside the body of Christ, we're told to serve each other. That's why Jesus Jesus showed us foot washing, right? Next week, we're going to have communion here at Waterway. And in that time when Jesus did communion and he said, look, you're part of my body, he also washed their feet because he understood that service is a part of loving someone. It's part of being brothers and sisters in Christ. How do we serve each other? Gerald, I appreciate you reading Matthew 18 earlier this evening. Part of the way that we serve each other is we are honest. When someone sins against us, when I am hurt, when you've hurt me, I'm supposed to come and talk to you one-on-one. Gerald, you hurt me. And I just wanted to let you know because I want to serve you in such a way that allows you to know that I value our relationship enough to work at it and not just stay home and be mad at you until you come around to your senses, right? This is part of serving each other. As we are honest, Kay, if you've hurt me, I need to talk to you, not just stay home and stew about it. We need to love each other enough to deal with it, right? Matthew 18 says, go talk to them. And if they've sinned, it's not just that like they said something that just kind of ticked you off. No, I'm talking about like Jesus is talking about when they sin, when there's a real problem here, go talk to them about it. Is that easy? How many of you find that easy? Oh, that's a hard, I know a couple of you find it pretty easy. But generally, that's a hard thing to do, right? We don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to make a big deal about it. Maybe we should just let it go, but yet inside it stirs and stirs. Jesus told us in Matthew 18, the chapter right after what we just read today, Jesus tells us, no, if if somebody sins against you, go and talk to them. 
And, and by the way, when you're talking to them and they've sinned, you're helping them because you're helping them to step out of their sin. If they say, no, I'm going to persist, well, then take a brother or two along and, and, and tell them, look, I'm, I'm coming with my brothers and sisters not to overpower you, not to intimidate you, but to, to, to tell you, look, you've been really wrong and I love you enough that I, I want to help you be back in full fellowship with me and with the rest of the church. And if they won't listen, then, then tell it to the whole church. Church, we've got a problem. We've got someone in our midst who continues to persist in sin. They say that they're a brother. They say that they're a sister, but, but they just continue to persist. They don't see their way. And, and if the person won't listen to the church, then, then treat them like a tax collector or a sinner. Well, how did Jesus treat them? He didn't invite them into full fellowship right away. He said, look, you've got sin that needs to be dealt with, but once you've dealt with your sin, welcome to the family of God, right? Right? You may need to keep a brother or sister at arm's length for a while, but only after you've talked about it, only after you've talked about it with them with a couple of other trusted brothers and sisters, and only if you've talked about it through the church. Some of us skip all those steps. They've heard us, and now they're out. Well, our love and our service and our generosity has to say that within the body of Christ, we're going to hold ourselves to a higher standard than that. We're going to do the work of talking to each other. This is why Jesus gave us these words showing us how to maintain our fellowship, how to serve each other with our love. In Colossians 3, the apostle Paul said to the church in Colossus that they should bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against anyone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And part of forgiveness is talking about these things. And I know that many of us struggle to talk about these things, but we must if we're going to be the body of Christ together and be more like Jesus. As we try to practice our generosity with those outside the body, as we try to practice our generosity within the body, we have to also deal with our own bodies. There's that challenging passage of Romans chapter 7 where Paul says, I don't understand what I do. He's a man who's fully devoted to God, but he said, I don't understand what I do. What I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. You've heard this before, right? For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. Romans 7, 19 says, I don't do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Paul, sa <laughs> Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says, I'm trying to serve those outside the body of Christ. I'm trying to serve those within the body of Christ. And even myself, I have conflict in me because there are things that I want to do that are good and yet I find myself slipping. And there are things that I don't want to do and I know they're bad, but sometimes I find myself giving in. He says, oh, I need Jesus. In all of this, I just need Jesus. I can't do this by ourselves. And we can see this in ourselves too, right? whether we're serving outside or inside the church or even as we're trying to take care of all the things happening inside of us, we can see that we can't do it all on our own. We need to have Jesus and it must be motivated by Jesus. And I believe we must all be humble. We must be patient to serve those outside of the body of Christ. We must be humble and patient to serve those within the body of Christ. And we must stay humble because God is patient and is still working on us and serving us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't a world that rewards the humble and the patient. Just look at the ads on TV. How do you win in this world? Patience and humility don't seem to fall into the equation. But church, we are not of the world. We are children of the king. We are going to have to be intentional about our salvation and our service and our thinking if we are going to live the way that Jesus taught us to live because it's swimming against the current of our culture. It is difficult to be a Christian in the world. So we're going to practice this. We get to practice it this week with some things that are on our calendar. We have a business meeting Wednesday night right here, 7 o'clock. Everybody's invited. One of the things that we're going to be talking about is it's a full house here some of these Sundays lately, especially now that we've started Sunday school, and we're talking about how to alleviate that. Do we keep doing this Saturday night service? Or do we need to have two services on Sunday morning to make it work? We're going to talk about that. You know what? We might not all agree, but we can talk about it figure it out, think it through. We'll get to practice serving each other. We'll get to practice being humble, being patient, but also speaking to our brothers and sisters in a way that matters and makes sense. Next Sunday, we have our communion service, and I hope that you'll be preparing for that this week. I hope that you'll, getting, that you'll be getting ready 
thinking about what it means to be part of the body of Christ. Next week, we're going to take the cup, the cup that symbolizes the blood of Christ. We're going to take a little wafer that symbolizes the body of Christ. We're going to say, I am part of this. Christ is in me, and I am in him, and we are in this together. And so this week, I hope that you will take stock of your own lives. Look what's, in with, look what's within you. Are you dealing with the same thing Paul did? You want to do some good things, but you're doing bad things. You don't want to do the bad things, but you can't do the good things. Well, take that to Jesus. This week, before you come next week, and, and you publicly and, and, and very practically show your faith by drinking the cup and eating the bread, before you do all that, make sure that you're checking your heart this week. And saying, God, I I need you within me. Please forgive me. Please pull me close to you, Lord. I'm repenting before you. You can't take communion if you haven't maintained your relationship with God. So do that this week, okay? This week, as you're getting ready for communion, I hope you'll consider your relationships with all your Christian brothers and sisters. Because next week, we're going to be taking that cup and that bread and saying that together we are the body of Christ. Well, are we? I mean, really, are we? Are we all? If, if there's somebody here in our church or if there's a Christian brother or sister in your life with whom you've just got a, a deep divide, and I'm not talking about like little disagreements and the things that we, you know, we all have our perspectives on stuff, but if there's somebody that, that you are just on bad terms with, before you take communion next week, you need to fix that up. How do you do that? Well, Matthew 18 gives you a pretty good model, right? If they've sinned against you, First of all, you need to be willing to forgive them, but if they've sinned against you, go talk to them. And if they won't hear you, we'll take one or two other trusted brothers or sisters that that can go along and kind of try to bring everybody to their senses. Okay, work at this. Here's a great week, an opportunity to do this, to take stock of our own lives, to consider our relationships with all Christian brothers and sisters, and especially our relationships with Christians here in our church. We do all carry grudges and hurts and wounds. These things happen sometimes, but we have a chance now to let them go because Jesus is working in us. The Jesus who healed this boy, even in the midst of a perverse generation. The Jesus who talked to his disciples about about dying on the cross, even when they didn't get it and their response wasn't what he might have hoped for. The Jesus who said, I'm going to take care of all your needs, Peter. Go fishing. Your tax will be taken care of. That same Jesus is working in our midst now. And we can be brought closer to God, we can be brought closer to each other, and we can be healed, and we can be whole. I hope that you'll work at some of those things this week. That's your assignment. Okay, that's your assignment. Check in with God this week. God, is is there anything I need to repent of? And if there is, repent. Let God forgive you. And and check in with your other brothers and sisters. If there's something that's just been kind of boiling between you, talk to them. Not to go yell at them, but to go talk to them. It just, I've, you know, you may not even remember it, but that thing that happened and that thing you said, I, look, I just feel weird about it. Would you forgive me? Or, or I've forgiven you, or, or you said something that really seemed mean, or, or you did something that really looked wrong. Can we talk about that and just bring this under the blood of Christ? We have an incredible opportunity this week to kind of hit the reset button for some of this stuff. That's what communion allows us to do. And I pray that you'll do that. Will you pray with me? Lord God, thank you. um, Thank you for serving us. Jesus, thank you for giving us an example of service. As you served your disciples, as you served and and healed this, this young boy who had seizures, as you, as you served Peter even by, by paying his taxes for him through the mouth of a fish. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you've, you've been at work on our behalf. And I pray that this week you'll continue to serve us by inspiring us to see if there are people we need to talk to, to see if there are relationships we need to make right, to see if there are things that we need to talk about humbly and patiently. Lord, show us your way. And Lord, please draw us closer and closer together. We are your body. We are the body of Christ. And so Lord, help us to be people who are brothers and sisters truly together. Help us not to be divided and help us not to let sin creep into our midst, but help us to deal with it and help us to all do it humbly and patiently, not with pride, not with anger, not with any sense of revenge on our hearts. 
but just knowing that this is what it means to live with you. And Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity next week to have communion together and celebrate your death and sacrifice for us. Lord, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, will you stand as we sing our closing song this evening? Central Committee has a uh, distribution center in Ephrata, and we're going to be traveling there. Um, folks from here are going to serve. Talk to Glenn or Eileen Engel if you'd like to be part of that on the 15th. On October 18th, that's a Sunday, uh, what used to be known as the Crop Walk is now known as the Help Hunger Walk, and it's going to be stepping off from here at Waterway at 1 o'clock on October 18th. And we can still use a couple volunteers for our community classroom project. Talk to me if you'd like to help out with that. Those are the announcements. Here's the pronouncement. I pray that you will go from this place knowing that the Lord is right there with you. He died for us on the cross and he rose from the grave for us so that we could know his power and he ascended into heaven and he's watching over us now. So I pray that you'll go from this place that you will serve your brothers and sisters in the church and be willing to serve everyone from outside of the church with the power and the patience and the generosity of Jesus Christ. So go from this place and let's do it, okay? Let's be the church and next week when we come back together we'll celebrate it 
by eating the juice and the bread and remembering that we are the body of Christ. Thank you, church, for being the church. Let's keep it up. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll see you next time.